Hello, my name is Romain Goulon. I'm mostly a metal drummer with various influences. And the idea behind this video is to give you important elements to develop your drum style with an open approach. If you're a metal drummer, that's a good point. But also it aims to give you a wide and open-minded base of modern vocabulary and concepts that contribute to the giant legacy of drumming through the 20th century and now the 21st century. Nowadays, it becomes very common to explore different kinds of music, to increase experience and musicality. That's why some chatters are not obviously related to metal or extreme metal. The world of internet is definitely changing the way we listen to music, the way we look at the instruments and drums. The purpose of the video is to describe some elements of my drumming, introduce you my way of feeling the drums, and how I try to incorporate technique and musicality in the song. Okay, so let's talk about my hand technique. Actually, I mainly use a wrist, and the last three fingers help to control the stick, like that. I barely use the finger technique, which is more or less uh, without the wrist moving. 
Okay, it's a personal choice, and moreover, uh, the full wrist motion is more natural for me actually. Um, so I can make the experience to remove the last three fingers and see what happens. It's still working because the main part of the motion is made by the junction between the index finger and the thumb, which is very strong, and motorized by the wrist itself. Okay, so of course I still need my three fingers uh, to help uh, to control the stick and get a better stamina. So I'm going to show you two exercises to develop your wrist and to get the blast beats better, for instance. The goal is to play one gust knot, one accent, in order to get your wrist more flexible. The purpose here is playing on a longer and longer period of time. This will help you to play more relaxed and increase the speed and stamina. But please, especially underline stamina before playing fast, okay? So just uh, put the metronome on, play 5x5 five five BPM, hand by hand, and then both hands together in 16 knots. And I don't know, just turn on the TV or read a book. Maybe you have noticed that both right hand and left hand need to revive the motion. Playing without reviving the action of the stick may reduce your stamina. Actually, it's a little bit like the battery of your smartphone getting low. The body needs to refresh the balance quite often. And same thing regarding the legs. You will naturally save energy when you work on stamina. And stamina is more important than anything else if you want to make it consistent. It's like if you wish to increase the battery autonomy.
it's a great opportunity to learn how to find the proper technique. So in the first place, try to play as long as you can on a medium tempo instead of playing as fast as possible. My right hand is using the wrist to play and revive the motion. But added to the wrist motion, you can notice if you look at the elbow, my arm is moving back and forth. The frequency depends on the feeling or the part I'm playing in the music. It may be every two hits, every three hits, every four hits, etc. It allows me to keep a good balance and power during rolls and blast beats. I call it Impulse Refreshment Motion, IRM. When you feel your roll too static and you're going to lose it, or it's getting weaker and weaker, you feel like refreshing the motion, like giving a new impulse. It's something I often do. My right hand is leading the single strokes roll when I play both hands. The left hand is using the wrist and a little more the fingers than for the right hand perhaps. The elbow revives motion by doing small circles, especially during blast beats. All this came naturally and although you must work on your wrist, the IRM won't be obviously something you decide. So just follow your body as soon as you try to get rid of any tension. I won't introduce you the Blast Beats basics. I guess if you're watching this video, you probably know quite a bit on it. I would like more to compare the one foot blast and the two feet blast. Personally, I think that using a technique in particular has a musical purpose. I use a one foot blast or the two feet blast, not always depending on how fast I can play. It's more a matter of feeling and musical context. Some blast beats will sound better a little more nervous and straight, whereas some parts will require blast beats that are sedate. The balance is completely different and will have consequences on the sound and feel. Ok, now please call your bandmates and ask them to do this exercise. But first, let me tell you a story. I've got many, many students who visit me and some of them don't see in the right direction when they try to get the blast beat better or faster. So I really hope this will help you. When a student tells me he can't get faster or can't play on a longer period of time, I'm pretty sure it has to do with hearing. It's not only a technique problem. That's why you must hear the off beat as good as you hear the on beat. You don't even need a stick if you're not a drummer. Just play the hands on your knees. Sit down anywhere 
you just need a metronome on your smartphone, for example, and play 16 notes at 60 BPM. Then play your right hand softer and softer until you remove it. Second exercise on the drums, kick, snare. The idea is to use a sheet of music like a simple 8 notes workout. Work on your interdependence and you'll be able to free your right hand and play the cymbals variations.
There are two methods to get your two feet blast tight. One, practice hit by hit. It's very helpful to understand the role of each limb. The other way is to consider you play 8 knots with your hands while your feet are playing 16 knots. Do it on kick and snare, then move your right hand from the snare to the right cymbal. Then try to double the length. Actually, it's quite tricky when you have trouble hearing the offbeat snare. Because basically, you're moving the right hand from the snare to the right cymbal without changing the technique. It's quite a good way to surprise yourself. In this chapter, I would like to talk about the foot techniques and my foot techniques. It is very important to mention that those are my personal foot techniques. And after watching this, just feel free to adapt all this to your taste and abilities. After years of working and thinking about the double bass work, I figured out that it was not always possible to imitate a specific or complex technique just by watching someone else doing it. It is sometimes impossible for you, whereas someone else can easily do it. If someone is telling you that you just need to practice, he may be partially wrong. At least the time required to get it will be very different for each drummer, because it's depending on many parameters. And then you may not have an identical technique. A few examples. The slide technique, the heel toe technique, the flat foot technique, the swivel technique are very specific techniques. So the question is, is it so important to give a name to what you play? Well, not so sure actually. However, it gives you a clue about what the drummer is playing, about the general feeling the muscles is using, etc. etc. So I think nowadays everyone is able to play the leg technique and most of the time the ankle technique.
The single stroke swirl is the most classical way of playing double bass drum. To work out your stamina and control, you can apply a very simple exercise, which is actually the most simple exercise ever. Just keep playing straight eighth notes with each foot, and then both feet in sixteenth notes, and check the accuracy. Just keep going as long as you can, for 30 seconds, 1 minute, 2 minutes, 5 minutes, and whatever. And very important, uh, play simple quarter notes or in general a simple pattern with the hands, in order to keep the focus on the feet. The next exercise is quite simple as well. Start at slow tempo, each foot individually, metronome 5 by 5 BPM, and try to find where in the tempo ladder you feel like you need another technique, or your ankle gets crazy without a full control. You must be careful and have a close-up on where you're having problems. You will progressively and naturally get the control over your ankles. Of course, once you master the ankle technique, the question remains. Where is the limit between the leg technique and the ankle technique? That's where you should work on, what I call the leg-ankle limit, LAL. The LAL may be different for each drummer, of course, but also depending on many factors, such as the time, muscles condition, etc., etc. It may change with yours as well. A voice should be stabilized once you got the optimum stamina and technique. So let's have a close up on my LAL. So from 0 BPM to 150, I use a leg technique without any doubt. Then between 150 and 170, I must pay attention 
It is where my lal is. And then from 170, I use the ankle. As you can see, the lal may slightly change every day. Let's go back to the close-up on the right foot now. Let's check out step by step what happens. I've got many students that come to me with foot problems. And in most cases, there are two possibilities. One, the drummer goes from the leg technique to a certain speed where he suddenly loses the control. And although the ankles want to take part in the motion, he can't accelerate and keep the control. Two, the drummer is able to play at slow tempo with the leg technique and at fast tempo with the ankle technique. But in between, he has troubles in the lal. I used to have troubles regarding my personal lal. Actually, I could easily lose the control and my brain was just confused. Because I was always wondering which technique shall I use, you know. And basically, all the parts I'm talking about were too fast for the leg technique and too slow for the ankle technique. So from those days, I decided to focus more on control. For any pattern, including this lal area, I practiced both techniques. And because depending on each day, the muscle's condition, general condition, if I'm not able to use one or the other, I can easily switch. It is very important that you don't give up your work and your practice routine on slower tempo, and especially on your lal speed. If you have songs in your band where your lal speed is required, then focus on it even more. It's very difficult to play and be good at any tempo and all the time. That's why you may have troubles with your lal speed from time to time. It's okay. Just give up for now and try to find a solution to not think too much about it and just wait for the next day. Single strokes roll can be very frustrating because basically you don't have the same stamina every day. So the ankle technique may be customized with a new motion such as a swivel technique or any technique which allows your body to save stamina. The purpose is to make the motion more clever. For every specific technique, you can try to work on it by analyzing the motion like watching a video, for example, or doing it by feeling. For instance, when I started playing the swivel technique, I didn't really pay attention to what my feet were doing. It's just that my body required the swivel.
Basically, I don't have the same motion on the right foot and left foot, and my swivel is not really academic. Later on, I checked out many drummers doing a RL swivel quite academic. I tried out and I simply could not change my way of playing the swivel. As I said before, nobody can come to you and say, hey, look at my technique, just practice and you'll manage to do it exactly like me. Get inspired, but don't worry if your body requires something else or needs more time than for anyone else. I wanted to get a technique that allows me to play on a longer period and faster. I discovered the heel toe more than 10 years ago on the internet. But the thing is, I didn't even try to do the heel toe for years, because I thought it would never be possible to make it work properly with triggers. And later on, I tried out, but I could not understand the motion. I would try as much as I could, and while some drummers had no troubles for playing it, I was stuck. Either I was not made for that, or I simply could not give up my single strokes. It felt like in some way I had to learn to relearn. A few years later, I could finally play the heel toe technique, but I could not go faster than a certain limit. From that point, I decided to think in a different way, and I got way faster. My brain has just to focus on playing double strokes, whatever the technique, whatever the motion my feet are doing. The goal here is to feel the rebound of the beater. That doesn't mean that you will count on the rebound, but you have to deal anyway with your drum head tuning and type of head and your pedal settings and stuff. So just put your foot on the board with the heel down, okay? And just feel the ribbon, try to control it and get two hits. From that workout, you can maybe guess what's going to work for you. For example, the heel toe. You can go from the heel down double strokes to the heel toe just by taking off your heel. You could have the slide technique working well or even a compromise between the heel toe and the sliding technique.
conclusion, you can get inspired by a technique and it may give you ideas to develop your own technique, either single strokes or double strokes. Don't be upset when you can't play the same technique than another drummer. Just follow your body. Imagine you have a guitar riff, a loop or anything you must play alone. The first question is what am I supposed to play here? Sometimes many ideas easily come up and you already hear the drums in your mind before even trying out on the kit. I don't have any magic trick to give you, but a method that may help you to get your licks more interesting or more musical. Interesting stuff doesn't always mean complex stuff. Don't get me wrong, but here I'm talking about the songs I perform on the DVD. And I will try to explain to you the methods I use to compose the drum lines. So let's go through this tab. It's one of the songs I play on the DVD, 
And here I would like to talk about the different methods I used to compose the drum lines. And the first concept is the concept of writing two different lines, which are, on one side, the patterns and fills made of snare, kick, toms, and effect symbols. And on the other side, the symbols work, which is the melodic side of the drums. Okay? So it's very important to separate the two different lines, this one, this one. Okay, see? So let's get started. The song starts with a fill, which is a short introduction be before the first beat. Okay, so it's made of groups of four or sixteen notes, snare, kick, splash, tom tom tom, triplets on the kick, going to the target, the stop if you want, the break, snare and crush. Then we start with the skank beat here, okay, made of kick and snare, as you can see, and on the other side, the cymbals work, the melodic side of the pattern, which is very important. So let's make a loop out of it and concentrate on uh, the melody on cymbals and um, at the same time the kick snare pattern. The next part is a drum fill made of a 4-4 bar and a 2-4 bar. And actually the 2-4 bar is an extension. Okay. So uh, it's like it starts in a 4-4 and we've got an extension to this full part. Okay. And going back to the skank beat again, same stuff. And then We've got a short blast beat on the hi-hat, on the right hi-hat, okay, close hi-hat. And then we have a transition preparing for the next part, which is a Slayer double bass part, what I call Slayer because it's a basically straight sixteenths notes on the, the kick and snare on every bit. So let's listen this from the beginning to this part. So then the same feel than before, skank beat again, a short blast beat again. And here we have a nice feel with a eighth note quintuplet, which is more or less giving the illusion uh, to slow down the, the tempo actually. To, so something weird is happening here, but as the tempo is quite fast, it's not, um, it's not the best opportunity to work on quintuplets here, of course but it still had something. And then we have a nice blast beat here going to the target here, which is a breakdown, so silent part. Preparing for the next part, okay? So, let's listen to the beginning to this point. Let's get started.
Okay, and then we have a kind of a modern metal pattern made of chinas, kick and snare. So uh, there's nothing really special to say here because the china uh, is pretty much straightforward on every bit. But as we have uh, weird and odd measures, uh, it kind of gives a nice and original balance here. So it's made of kick and snare here. And uh, very important, those 16 knots on the kick, which is made uh, with the heel toe technique only on the right foot, actually. So we're going to make a loop from this part to this part. Here we have a fill, a kind of straightforward fill. I kind of like those fills uh, with a kick symbol and three toms or three snares and stuff. You know, it gives a, a really, um, yeah, I don't know, a really intense uh, impression and uh, quite brutal. And then we've got a regular skank beat, okay, from measure. 35 to measure 40. Okay, it's pretty simple. Nothing real special and technical because we, we are preparing uh, with this transition added to this kink beat, we're preparing the heel toe bomb blast uh, where we should uh, focus actually because there is nice uh, symbols work here. So we're going to make a loop out of it and please focus on the symbols because there is definitely something uh, happening, as you can see. Okay, here I separated uh, kick and snare symbols. I don't know why actually, but it works. Um, so let's do it. So as you can see uh, on the video, it's uh, pretty much a question and answer uh, pattern because it's playing uh, on the left side and then on the right side. So it's very, um, very important to mention it because I composed it in purpose, okay? Um, the next part is kind of interesting as well here. Because we are in 3 4 again, and uh, the snare is kind of delayed. You know, the, the snare should be on the second beat, but it's delayed on the off beat. Okay? And it, it gives uh, an original balance actually, so let's listen to it. Okay, the following is made of uh, many different stuff. So, uh, a transition here on the kick with the heel toe technique on the right foot. Okay, take it, take it. Then we reach this part, which is again a modern metal part with China kick and snare with some uh, splash here. 
and uh, right bell. Okay, nothing really special. And uh, from this point, I would like to go through the tab because there is definitely something happening here. We're making a loop out of it. And uh, let's discuss about it after hearing it. You could probably uh, notice the uh, cymbals melody. It's one of my favorite parts here. Uh, and of course, this special stuff, which is a, a weird skank beat in quintuplets and in 5 4, giving definitely the illusion that it's slowing down, okay? But everything is slowing down, but it's not. And this feels after the quintuplets. In triplets, so it's um, it's getting faster after the queen of blitz. So there is just um, something um, disturbing here, and interesting musically, I guess. I hope, at least. Uh, if we keep going, uh, still the same part. Yeah, here, and oh yeah, we're going to analyze this stuff. This weird stuff. So let's listen to it first. So here, what's happening? Actually, it's quite simple in a way. The snare is doing pretty much everything, giving the illusion we're in different time signature. That's why you can hear a really weird pattern here, a really weird transition. And going back with the guitars here, okay, in a more logical uh, breakdown part. Okay. And then, nothing real special here. Quite uh, straightforward, uh, double bass parts and blast beats. And then we go back to the skank beat again. Okay, same part, same part, same part. Um, yeah, those are pretty much the same parts than we went through before. And uh, this is the transition before a new Hilto bomb blast. So let's listen to it. There's nothing really special, just kick, snare and cymbals. A little bit of cymbals melody here. Okay. So just pay attention to it. And then we've got a new Hilto bomb blast, a little bit like the, the one before, but only on the left side of the drums, okay, on the cymbals, I mean. So we've got a nice uh, cymbals melody here, okay, going to from this point to this point, okay. So pay attention to the symbols melody again. Let's make a loop out of it.
as you can notice, maybe the China is kind of leading the stuff, you know. Uh, yeah, the China is very important here. And uh, this part ends with a coordination fill. Okay, snare, kick, tom, kick, and so on. And we're going through a special part which is more or less with the snare on every bit and some burst. The very important thing here is we try to keep the same cymbals melody than on the hilltop bomb blast, but playing on the right side of the drums. So with different cymbals, but the same melody actually, as you can notice. So let's play it. And then the next part is a quite straightforward skank beat. And same reason than before, a straightforward skank beat, very simple to prepare something quite uh, fast, okay, with the double bass here. And then a blast beat on the right. And going to the transition. I kind of like this one. This is very short, just a 2-4 bar with triplets on tom, floor tom actually, and going to a high tom, okay? And then we, we have another part, which is made of skank beat, with snare on a off beat, and cymbals, uh, melody, and kick burst. So let's play it. So as you can see, the kick fits quite well with the guitars, doesn't it? And then we have a special coordination here, which is a coordination I explained in a YouTube video. If you check out my uh, YouTube channel, it's basically right hand, left kick, left hand, right kick, okay? From this knot to bass knot. And we've got four snare to hand the, the fill because it's quite difficult to uh, play the fill until something else, you know. You have to, uh, actually I have to <laughs> play a transition to be comfortable and uh, be able to uh, play this, uh, this next part. The next part is uh, very important, again, for the same reason than before, because of the cymbals melody. This cymbals melody is one of my favorite, actually. And because the kick snare is pretty much straightforward, doing um, a simple, on the principle, I mean, a simple uh, blast beat. So let's listen to it. And we end the song with the same feel than the first feel of the song.
The substitution method is a way of getting your pattern more interesting by using sound replacing. I use this method in rhythms to make them more exciting. The idea is to start with a pattern and replace a regular sound played by a limb by several alternate sounds without changing the rhythm. The purpose is to add layers, like other dimensions, new melodic lines that can be heard separately. You may use different grouping illusions. So of course it may become very complex, but the principle is quite easy to understand. The most important is to consider loops and see when they start and when they end. All of those terms can be very confusing, and we can imagine so many different situations. Actually, it's quite crazy, isn't it? But first, let's try to understand what polyrhythms and polymeters mean with some examples. Let's take a simple example. Just play a basic 4-4 on the right symbol, tempo 120 BPM. First step, switch the right hand between the bell ride and the regular ride every hit. So it doesn't change anything to the right hand speed and flow. Now you're gonna switch every three hits on the bell ride. And now we can hear two different groupings, both in quarter notes. The right hand seems to be in three, whereas the rest is playing a regular four. We consider those two drum lines as polymeter since there are two different note groupings on the same speed, 120 BPM. The primary layer is in four, and we have another layer in three. As I said before, we need to know the length of the loop. And if we look at it, we need to find the least common multiple for 3 and 4. LCM here is 12. That means the loop makes 12 bits. So those two different fillings are based on the same subdivisions, quarter notes, but grouped in a different way. Let's see what we can find on Wikipedia. Polyrhythm is a simultaneous use of two or more conflicting rhythms that are not readily perceived as deriving from one another or simple manifestations of the same matter. So two rhythms make a polyrhythm. If they don't sound like they have obvious links, they sound like they are two conflicting rhythms, like they don't use the same basic grid. Those are, for example, two against three, 3 against 4, 4 against 5, etc, etc. Each line has its own flow, but they share the same measure, 4-4 four, four here. So the loop is very easy to see, it's the measure itself. We consider 2 and 3 as polyrhythm since they appear to be two conflicting rhythms with no manifestation of the same matter. So eighth notes and triplets are two conflicting rhythms. 
Conclusion. We consider two rhythms as polymeter when there are two different knot groupings on the same speed. And we consider two rhythms as polyrhythm when they appear to be two conflicting rhythms with no obvious common subdivision. So of course we can mix polymeters and polyrhythms and get crazy stuff. In the next examples, you will see all the details and you will probably understand better. The question-answer method allows to add a melodic and musical side to your patterns. The purpose is to let the listeners imagine they hear a dialogue, a conversation. So let's see a few structure examples.
The goal of this chapter is to improvise with your limbs on a constant flow. It's what I call linear improvisation. When I talk about improvisation to my students, I often mention the inspiration from their favorite drummers. But the thing is, the experience is not only built up just by listening to other drummers. It's a little more tricky. And a big part of improvisation is a matter of reflexes. The concept of giving rules is necessary to develop and increase your vocabulary. Very important. The rules are restricted here in order to not get lost. The following steps may sound quite mathematical to you, but believe me, the purpose is musicality and not mathematics. This hyrolex method may give you better and faster reflexes and a consistent motion between the four limbs. That's why I decided to reason in terms of probability. Which limb is going to give the next hit? And you know what? The answer is already in your mind way before you even hit the next drum. That's how the brain works. The ideas coming from your brain and going to your limbs via your neural system will be getting better and better with a good practice routine and experience. To start with the RLX method, the first idea is to improvise and randomly alternate R, L and X. R for the right hand, L for the left hand and X for both. X may be a flam if you wish. The first exercise will only be with the right hand and the left hand. So we've got R, L or X. Again, X is a flam or both hands together, it's up to you. To make it easier, just pick up two different sounds, such as the right hand on the floor tone and the left hand on the snare, in order to clearly separate right and left, okay? So, we'll use several lengths to practice and here we're going to start with eight hits plus one hit. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one. And the last hit, the landing hit, is a target. So you should underline first hit going to the target. It's very important, okay? And in between, we're going to improvise with R, L, or X, okay? But it's very important, again, to clear up your mind and to know which letter is going to start and which one is going to end. So, first step, choose the length. Let's take 8 plus 1. Second step, pick up the first hit and the target. So let's take, for example, right to right. So we've got right, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, right. We call this exercise 8 plus 1, R to R. And then just add dynamics. We'll try to play an accent on the target.
After doing this workout, it's time to apply it on the full kit. Of course, you're not playing anymore one limb is one song, but you will randomly move your hands all around the kit, and that makes a big difference. So now we're going to do the same exercise as the previous one, but this time including the right foot F. So now we've got R, L, X and F. So of course, in order to not make it too much complex, I won't go into the details, but you could play either F with R, F with L, etc. But then we would need too many letters and I don't think it's necessary. So just feel free to play the kick with symbols or the kick alone, etc., etc. And then just add the left foot to the party.
Conclusion. This exercise starts from your imagination and inspiration. I think everyone should be able to improvise at his own speed. A good practice method will increase your experience, accuracy and of course speed.
unusual rhythmic flows. What is it? Those are rhythms that appear to be not familiar for most people. Most of us find more natural to count in four or in three, while counting in five or seven seems weird and uncomfortable. In fact, it has to do with our culture. Who knows, if Mozart had mainly composed his music in 5-4, or if every commercial music on the TV was in 7, maybe nowadays we would find very weird to count in 4. It is very important to make the difference between odd time signatures and unusual subdivisions in a standard time signature. Let me give you an example with the number 5. In the first case, we have an odd time signature, let's say 5-8. The flow is constantly in 5, we are playing around 5. In the second situation, I call it time stretching. Let's say we have a standard 4 4 bar and we include subdivisions in 5. For example, a 4 4 bar with 16 notes to quintuplets. As you can see, it is a totally different approach from the 5-8. You go from the 6 notes to the quintuplets by accelerating just a little bit, and we would do the opposite from the 6 plates to quintuplets by slowing down just a little bit. You must adapt your speed and get good transitions.
The purpose is to use different groupings on a counting like 5 or 7. It will create another kind of rhythmic illusion, which I call odd grouping illusion. Those are polymeters, actually. For instance, taking 5 or 7 and making groups of 2 notes, 3 notes, rudiments, using paradiddles, etc. etc. Again, we can hear two different fills. The primary fill in 5 or 7, and the other fill with the odd grouping. I use the term time stretching for odd subdivisions in a standard context, like in 4 4, in 3 4, in 6 8, etc. Et I think it's very important to understand the difference with the previous part. There is time stretching as soon as we are under the impression the tempo changes for a while. And because those subdivisions are mixed in more standard flow, we're not in a time signature where they would be welcome. The goal here is to get unusual effects. The time seems to be elastic and the beats give the illusion to be not stable. That's why I call it time stretching. A few examples.
Mm-hmm.